steps weren't the, the most natural steps, to be honest with you. If I say to the kids, um, don't follow my path. I decided to leave school before my 16th birthday and go into professional soccer, and it's, there's no guarantee. I, growing up, never believed I would be anything else. And it was really naive. As you grow up, you, you mature, you think, what if it had gone wrong? After you've had your life in, in the game, in your career, what if it had gone wrong? Did I get my education? Should I have got my education? Being in England and growing up in England, every boy's dream was to, to be a footballer. And I actually was fortunate enough to live my dream. Um, to go and actually do something in your life that you love, that you would do for free and get paid for it, was a bonus. Honestly, it was the um, best life you could ever wish for. The second goal now would take some pressure off. Well, that's not a good clearance. Bishop, he's got it. 2-0 for City. Whelan, well read by Bishop. He's got two to the left, one to the right. And through the middle is Lake. He's in on Grobola and he's put it wide. No, I mean, I could have, and I had a lot of friends that probably did, that took the same path as me and fell by the wayside a little bit later, you know? But at the end of the day, it's, it's you as an individual, you as a person. You make your own decisions, you make your life choices. And if I'd have gone and failed, I'd have made it into something else. I had a big belief in myself that whatever I set my mind to, I was going to succeed at. To see the kids today and to say, you know, you should strive, you should sacrifice, make a commitment. It, it's okay saying it to them after the fact, but believe me, if they do have that desire and that hunger to be a player, it's, it's nothing better than doing your job in front of 40, 50,000 people every week. Redmond got it back for City. Bishop, that's a good ball for Morley. Can Alan reach it? He does, and that will please the manager-elect. I was actually, when, when I signed for Everton, I was supposed to go and play for England volleyball team. <laughs> and I gave it up because I was just, my heart and my passion was in the, the socket. Who knows what would have happened if I had chose the other path, but uh, I don't think I took the wrong fork in the road, you know? Because yeah. there was nothing better than waking up Sunday morning when you know you'd had it off on a Saturday. You'd, you'd, you would shone, you'd done well, you may have scored the winning goal. You woke up, you wanted to go and get the newspapers and read about yourself and, and see the headlines and, and sit in the pub Sunday afternoon with people talking about you, people being nice about you because you had too many days when people were nasty to you. You were in the public eye, your job was out there for everybody to see, there's no hiding place, none whatsoever. You were doing it in the public, in the full view of everybody. You could kid yourself, you wouldn't get away with it because everybody's seen it. Now, in a, in a modern day with television and every game's televised, you can't hide. But for me, that pressure of not being able to hide would have lifted me more, you know. You thought, might as well have a go. Yeah, well, I'd slid in and I'd had a 50 50, I think it was with uh, Daryl Pal. And I think I just had the strength left in my legs to stand up and swing my left foot at it. So. I mean, the worst part was afterwards when everybody jumped on me. I think I was down there for five minutes. I couldn't walk when I got so, up. Uh, don't, don't be fooled by anybody who thinks, oh, you're out of order, you shouldn't put me down like that. You know what? It's the best game in the world, the best life in the world. To, to go and do your job in front of 40, 50,000 people, it should make you rise to the occasion. And you try and emphasise to the kids, nobody plays a perfect game. Nobody. Okay, how good you are, best player in the world. Never, don't play a perfect game. That's the beauty of it. There's always something to work on. And for me, I wouldn't have had it any other way. If I was, if I was, and, and I look differently to everybody else. In my day and age now, people have headbands and long hair. I was one of the only people with the long hair and the headband. And I used to get abused because I look different. But you know what, you look different, you're gonna stand out. If you stand out and you have an off day, you've had a terrible day. If you stand out and have a good day, you've had a great day. And I was willing to take that chance because I had confidence in myself. My ability, my managers used to say to me, and they say to other players, right, I want you to do this, defend well, overlap, make sure you get your cross in, look inside, 
and they'd say, oh, your centre backs, make sure you're strong, win all your headers, you know, drop off, get the ball to give it. The manager used to say to me, go and enjoy yourself. Just go and do your stuff. Because they had faith in my ability, because they knew I had faith in my ability. And it's all about the ball. Don't give the ball to the other people. They can't hear you without the ball. And my job, and what I did was keep in possession. Keep in possession and create things. Keep in possession and create things. That's what it's all about. I actually scored more headers than people realise. Being a midfield player and a creative midfield right. player, people think, oh, there he is, he scored a header. It's not like him. When I look back over the amount of goals I scored, probably a third of them were headers. Captain finds Keane. Oh, it's a lovely cross, and Ian Bishop, who started the move, finishes it with a brave head. It's just people don't associate you with doing that sort of thing, you know. Um, it's a bit of a fallacy, really. I look back and think, I can now, even now, remember six or seven out of probably, I don't know, 30. I didn't score many goals because I was a more defensive creative, setting things up type of midfield player. I would have loved to have had the luxury like a Frank Lampard, like a David Platt, where you can go from the halfway line forward. To me, that's not a midfield player. You may start in midfield, but if you're playing for somebody like Chelsea, and you have the luxury, because you know your teammates are going to keep the ball well enough to give you time to wander into the box, like a Paul Scholes, Man United, and go in and get yourself in positions. Don't get me wrong, them players, have a knack for scoring goals. I don't think I had a knack for scoring goals. I think that's what sort of kept me back a little bit. Them players believe they're going to score every time they get in the box and they find positions. And it only takes half a chance for them. And the ball's there and it's in the back of the net, you know. But that wasn't me. I wanted more involvement in the game. I wanted every second pass to be mine. I wanted to lend the ball to people. I'm not giving it to you, I'm going to lend it because I'm going to get it back in a second. Your games you play and, and the training you do takes its toll. And it's just a fact of life that as you get older, if I was if I was the type of player that wasn't a first choice player, I could have played till I was 50. Because you don't play as many games, you don't exert yourself as much. I played over 700 first team games. And it's something I'm proud of. And the pain I get these days when I wake up reminds me of what I've achieved and what I've done. And I actually say to people that, I miss Sunday morning, waking up, feeling like I've been in a battle. I miss it because I had it for 20 years, 22 years or whatever it was, of waking up, knowing the day before I've been in a proper battle. Sunday mornings now, is has got out of bed. The birds are singing. It sounds good, but it's not, because I'd rather have the pain and the suffering, knowing of what I've done the day before. It's weird, it's, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit, uh, what's the word? Oh. Narcissistic or, you know, for somebody to miss pain no. is, is a little bit strange, but it wasn't the pain, it was where the pain had come from and, and how you felt and knowing what you'd done the next day. Well, I actually left England because I didn't want to be part of the game anymore. I didn't like the way the game went. I didn't like the people that were involved in it. I didn't like the fact that I watched some of my best friends trample over their best friends to get a job. In, like in the, soccer? Yeah, in soccer, yeah. I didn't like the backstabbing aspect of it. I couldn't do it. It wasn't me. And I, I just felt like, well, you know, not just get away from the game. I'll get away from where the game is. And it was a little bit drastic to, to move three, four thousand miles away. But, and then I'm still living the game. I can't. It's hard to let the game go. It's difficult enough to accept life as an ex-player. It's hard, and I know some of my friends, some of my players that I know, have found it tough, you know, but I'll never, ever stop living this game. It's Whether it's with the kids, whether it's just myself on a Sunday going and 
having a pick-up game with some mates. I'll never let the game go out of my system. And one thing I'd like to instill and to, to put across to kids is whether I'm the best coach or the worst coach, I have this desire for, for the game. I want to pass on. This is how you can feel about it. And instill it into yourself if you really want it. You wake up every morning, there's not a second thought that isn't about football, you know? Get on with everyday life, but the game comes into your life every day, at some stage. And I'm still doing it. About you and decisions you have to make on the field. And my biggest thing as a coach is to say to the kids, you make the choices. Me as a coach, I want to step away. I want to give you the tools to use. I want you to pick the right tool for each job, for each occasion, for each whatever. And gradually I'll step away. If the further I step away, the more you're doing your job out there, the more chance you have of becoming a player. We emphasize to the kids, you train for yourself. You train for you. You play for your team. It all happens on the training ground. That's where you put your work in. You, you see a golfer, he, he goes around the course and he hits 70 shots. Where's his work done? On the driving range where he's hit 700 shots. You perfected a training and you showcase it on a Saturday or on game day. And sometimes it doesn't work. It doesn't mean you're a bad player, it's just you've had a bad day. Uh, the World Cup in Korea was 0-2 and, and they got to the last day, which we thought, great, because now the game's going to boom. And you're expecting this boom and it didn't happen. So if it can't happen when you reach the last day of the World Cup. What is going to make it happen, you know? I think the catching on now to the rest of the world about how it's supposed to be run, where it was before a single entity, the owners ran the league, the clubs, the refs, players. Now there's different people coming in. And don't get me wrong, <coughs> I had me gripes with the MLS, but they're trying to do it right now to the benefit of the game, to the benefit of the kids, the youngsters coming through. I think every MLS club should have its own academy and be funded. I think they concentrate on the end product rather than the build up to be the end product. You know, the youth system here is wrong, it's broken and the likes of West Ham coming here trying to emphasise their structure and how successful they are with what they do. It's, it's a coach oriented, orientated game at the youth level. Every other sport in this country is coach orientated because the coach makes the plays. This game, players are out there making their own choices. But there's too many coaches think it's about them. I need a winning team because it will enhance my reputation as a coach. For me, that's the wrong outlook, the wrong way to go about it. It's about developing players, not developing teams here. They develop teams. And one coach will stay with one team and take them through and go, oh, I've got four state cups and this and that. So what? How many players went on to do something for themselves at the end of it all? Very, very few, very little. Because they were geared towards the game not towards the development as players. You develop the team. Anyone can go out and coach a winning team. You can say to your kids, get away from your goal, put it down that end. People will make mistakes, you'll get goals. Then we'll shut up shop and we'll win games. It's easy. You're not blindfolded. Can you make kids into players and give them the best shot at life? Whether it be college, whether it be USL, whether it be MLS, whether it be playing in the Champions League for somebody one day. We succeed when they succeed. As coaches and trainers, we win. Not because we earn a fortune. We win when we see one of our products out there doing well for themselves.